Welcome to Confessions of a Parent Coach. I'm coach, mother of four, and potty talker, Ann Kaplan. This is the podcast where I confess something from my own parenting and coaching life, teach a lesson around it, and answer your questions. Even we parenting experts are far from perfect, and the real magic happens when we get down with all that imperfection. We get into the gritty side of parenting here, so earbud up and dive in. Welcome in podcast listeners. Excited to be here with you again for another episode this week. And what we're going to be talking about this week is what well, I like to say the two greatest skills that we have as parents. And if you think you don't have the skill, you do. you just probably don't use it nearly as often as you should. So I'm going to tell you what those two skills are. But first, I'm going to give you my little confession. So My son, I'm recording this right now um, in the middle of August, and my son, Elijah, my eldest, pride of my life, apple of my eye, he just went away to college. So on Monday, I dropped him off at his dorm, helped him get all moved in. It was like, I felt like I did a pretty good job. Like I kept it together. Honestly, I wasn't even trying to keep it together. I was having a really good time. Like (laughs) my predominant emotion the entire time was like, oh my God, I'm so jealous of you because college is so fun. And I was like, oh, he's starting the best chapter of his life. I wish I could go back to college. Oh my God. So it was just, I had a great time setting up his dorm and just hanging out with him and all that stuff. But then like towards the last 15 minutes of um, dropping him off, it kind of hit me like, I have no place here. I should leave. And that didn't feel great. So I cried a little bit, but not too much and um, drove away. And I was a big girl about it. But um, what my confession about isn't about dropping him off. It was about what happened a few days later. So a few days later, his roommate starts moving in and he's starting to meet the other people on his floor and all of this stuff. And it's not going great. Like he calls me and he's just like, oh, mom, I just think this roommate is not going to be good. And he's just really upset. And Elijah chose to live um, in the sober living dorm um, because he is struggles with addiction and he's in recovery and he just thought it would be really good for him to have a sober place to come back to where he doesn't have to even experience any sort of pressure or temptation or whatever. And I thought that was really cool. And I was proud of him for choosing that. Well, it turns out like his sweet mate vapes a weed, not just cigarettes or not just nicotine or whatever. And so between listening to him talk about how his roommate behaves and telling me that this sober living dorm has like someone literally sharing a bathroom with him that is smoking weed all the time. I really had a hard time. And I, I think I did a pretty good job of just trying to be supportive of him. But what I really wanted to do was find, like, I will tell you all the things that came into my head that I almost did, but didn't do. Um, first I thought that I might want to call the school and say, what the hell, this is supposed to be a sober dorm. Like, what are you going to do about it? Or I was going to do some research about like, how do you make a complaint about, um, your roommate or how do you, um, apply to have a different roommate? Like do all this research for him so that he could just have all the steps right there at his fingertips. I was like, literally at one point in the conversation, like I felt like we did a good job talking through his emotions and, you know, Elijah's a really sensitive kid and he's also done a lot of his own work. So, you know, at one point in the conversation, he's like, okay, I I know what I need to do. I need to get off the phone with you and I just need to go and cry. And he was totally right. That was like a really actually very emotionally intelligent thing for him to say, but it made me just really have tear up myself. And I just was so upset for him and everything. And so honestly, this is all to say that my confession to you today, listeners, is that I seriously wanted to rescue my son. I wanted to fix this problem for him. I wanted to make it right. And and I was upset. I was like mama bear a little bit on his behalf because he shouldn't be in this position and you know, all of this stuff. And, um, So that is what we're talking about today. What are our two greatest skills? What are the two skills that I used yesterday once I was able to pull my head out of my ass? They are two things, biting your tongue and sitting on your hands, stepping back so kids can step up. It is so hard. 
And this is why I say, you do have the skill. I know that you can do nothing. It is possible. (laughs) Most moms, when I tell them that are like, I cannot do nothing. I can't just sit down. I can't ever sit still. I'm never not doing anything. I'm never doing nothing. Like, um, I had a friend a long time ago share this like post. It was like a little funny, um, writing on Facebook where this person was saying like, this is how a, a dad goes to bed, turns off the TV, says, okay, I'm going to bed and walks straight to the room and gets in bed. This is how a mom says that she's going to bed. <laughs> she's like, okay, I'm going to bed. And then she gets up and she takes all the dishes that are on the coffee table and puts them in the kitchen. And then she straightens up and cleans off the counter. Cause it's got crumbs all over it. And then she kind of walks by the laundry room and realizes there's a basket of clean clothes. So she takes it with her on her way to the bedroom. And then, you know, realizes the dog hasn't gotten let out yet. So she walks back out to the living room, lets the dog out. Right. So anyway, the point is it is very hard. It is very hard, even though we all have the ability to bite our tongues and sit on our hands, we don't do it. It is hard to do. And especially when you're a parent, whether you're a mom or a dad or non-binary, doesn't matter. That's irrelevant. We get into the habit as caretakers of doing, doing, doing all the time because it's the job of caring for a child is never ending, is relentless. But if you can give yourself permission to sit on your hands and bite your tongue, you will be doing your child such a big favor. This example with Elijah, you don't need me to connect those dots for you. Like, obviously it would not have been helpful at all to Elijah for me to like go Googling around on the website for the school to figure out what the protocol is for this, or, you know, even do something more extreme, like talk to his RA or something like that. Oh my gosh. Can you imagine? That would not be helpful for him. This is a time in his life where he needs me to step back so he can step up. He is adulting now and it's exhausting. It is overwhelming. It's normal and natural. Even if he had the world's best roommate and no one was breaking the rules on his floor, it is normal and natural for him to feel the like holy shitness of living on his own for the first time and being emancipated. So he needs to feel that and he can only truly experience that and learn from that and grow from that. If I get the fuck out of the way, this is true. No matter how old our kids are, it's really easy to see that with an 18 year old who's off at college. It's harder to see that with a kid who is a toddler going to preschool and having problems with a friend on the playground or our school-aged kid who's getting notes home because they haven't finished their homework or our high schooler who's getting, you know, not great grades or whatever it is. It's harder when our kids are younger, maybe, but if you don't build this muscle now, it's going to be even more glaring how off kilter you are with what is appropriate for your kid as he gets older or they get older. So Think about what happens when we bite our tongue and sit on our hands. What we're doing is switching from a solving role to a supporting role. And if you followed me for any amount of time, you've heard me say many times, switch from solving to supporting. So it's normal and natural, just like what happened to me when I was talking to Elijah on the phone. It's normal and natural when we are presented with the challenge to immediately try to overcome that challenge. And our brains don't do a great job of distinguishing between the challenges that are ours and the challenges that are not ours. A challenge comes in, our brains really want to arise above that challenge. That's what brains do. They're problem solving machines. But really what our kids need is support from us. They do not need them us to solve their problems at all. A few weeks ago, I sent out an email about um, one of my kids, not Elijah, my daughter, who was having a really tough time with um, my mother-in-law, her grandmother, actually. And when she came into the room to talk to me about it, my brain immediately was like, I've got to do something about this. I need to talk to my mother-in-law. You know, it's not cool what happened between them. Maybe I need to, you know, figure out a different sleeping arrangement in the house or whatever because they were sharing a room. And, um, but I remembered to support versus solve. So I just stayed with her. I gave her a hug. I validated all of her emotions. Meanwhile, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, so once she's done crying about this, now we're going to have to figure out a solution. So what, what should I suggest? What will it be? What, what am I going to say to her? I was so wrong. 
like after I finished like hugging her and just, she cried, cried for a while and I validated her emotions. I told her, you know, it makes perfect sense that you feel that way. You have every right to think that, you know, all of that stuff. She just took a deep breath, sniffed a few times and changed the subject. And we were joking around and totally had moved on within like a minute or two. And that is so easy to forget that a solution is the last thing our kids need. They just need someone in their corner. So if you can sit on your hands and bite your tongue, those are the most profound gifts you can give to your child is the most important parenting skill under the sun. Whether we're talking about a kid who's having a tantrum, sit on your hands and bite your tongue. Let them have their tantrum and they will calm down. Do not engage. Do not exacerbate. Do not dramatize. Do not catastrophize. Just do nothing. Or we're talking about an 18 year old who's having uh, trouble with his roommate and all of this stuff. Like just do nothing. Sit on your hands, bite your tongue, let it happen. Trust in your kid. Your kid came earthside equipped with all of the ingredients to put together whatever this moment, whatever meal this moment <laughs> demands. They have all the building blocks. They can do it. And obviously we do that in age appropriate ways, but sitting on your hands and biting your tongue, those are the two skills I want you to work on today. You can do this today. Think about this for the rest of your day. Where are times where you are about to say something and you hold it in, bite your tongue? Where was the time when you were about to intervene and fix something for what's a kid learning to tie their shoes, for example? Think about all of those moments and do it just for one day and see what happens. See what happens when you sit on your hands and bite your tongue. See how people step up when you step back. That is my wish for you today, listeners. And I will see you again next week. Bye. The episode is over, but there's more waiting for you. You can grab my free workbook, Getting Kids to Listen the First Time, that walks you through the fundamental principles I teach all of my clients and applies them to this very universal parenting challenge. So if you're sick of repeating yourself all day long or just want to learn more about my style, you'll definitely want to go to bit.ly slash kids who listen. And if you're ready to work with me, let's meet. Set up a free call at bit.ly slash Kaplan call and let's create an action plan that gets you exactly where you want to go. And of course, links to all this goodness are in the show notes. Thanks for joining and I'll see you next time.